Hello everyone, good afternoon or good morning for those of you joining us in other parts of the world. Um, very happy to welcome you to this Weave Lab Day. Um, it's a capacity building lab day um, on Archives and the Dancing Body. We're very excited to welcome you. We have a lovely um, group of artists and researchers and archivists um, who are joining us today. Um, some from CDARE, some from abroad. Um, so we're very happy. We hope that um, you enjoy, have been enjoying the Weave Lab Day series, but if this is the first session that you're joining, the Lab Day is a methodology that we're using, that we've been developing within various projects, um, but it's a, about bringing people together from different um, perspectives, different experiences and sharing and maybe looking at a problem or a tension or a couple of questions within um, a sector or a, a an area. Um, so for today, we're looking at archives and the dancing body and really exploring archival practices and how the dancing body, what the dancing body and that embodied knowledge and ways of knowing can help us um, maybe understand, unpick, um, how it can help us push uh, things forward. Um, so we're very excited to, to start the day. But with that, before we start, um, we do try to be as inclusive as possible. For those of you that would like an audio description, my name is Rosa Cisneros. I am a female sitting in a cream colored chair wearing a navy blue top. Um, I'm olive skin tone. My long black hair is pulled up. Today I'm used, allowing my fringe to fall down onto my face. Um, I have dangly earrings, um, olive skin tone, and I'm sitting in front of a burgundy wall. If you have any questions or comments, please do contact myself or Kozer, who is the uh, the hero behind the scenes who's always helping us with our lab days. So do feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions or need any support. We are um, a family friendly animal, animal friendly environment. So please do feel free to leave your camera on or off as you wish. Um, we are recording and we are saving the chat. So the final recording will go online. Um, so just be mindful of that. And as always, this is a very safe and brave space. So please do feel free to share your thoughts in a respectful manner, challenge each other. Um, but we just ask you to do that in a way that is supportive and kind to each other. Um, so thank you. And without further ado, I'd like um, to invite our guests to um, introduce themselves and to come into the space. We have Rachel and Monica and Lily and Jenna and Sarah. So hello and welcome. Maybe a quick round of introductions, one minute. Rachel, would you like yes. to go first? Yes, sure. Hi everyone. Um, it's lovely to be part of today's conversation. So I'm Rachel Davis. I'm a PhD student at the Center for Dance Research, Shida in Coventry. Um, and I am working with Chisholm Hell Dance Space um, and looking at their early history and working with their archive. Um, and yes, I am a white woman. Um, I have dark hair and my fringe is also over my face as well today. Um, and I'm sitting in a room with white walls and there's a bookshelf behind me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rachel. Monica, would you like to go next? Yes. So uh, I would say good morning, good afternoon. <laughs> uh, I thank uh, uh, you, Rosa. My name is Monica Dantas. I'm from Brazil, from Porto Alegre, the south of South America. Uh, and I'm, I am associate professor at Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. And I'm also a dancer, so I'm a white woman, oh, uh, come see, come. something like that. And uh, I have black uh, hair and I'm wearing uh, red glasses and uh, there is also a bookshelf. And uh, okay, uh, I, I speak English, uh, but sometimes I, I 
enfim, it's, it's not so, <laughs> but I'm really happy to be here and I'm going to try to do my best sharing the work with uh, Eva Schulz Archive. Thank you, Rosa, for the invitation. And I'm really happy to be here uh, with <laughs> Sarah and everyone and uh, see there are people with whom I've been collaborating since 80 years, I think. Thank you, Monica. Lovely. And thank you for joining us. It's very early there, so thank you for joining us um, here in the UK. Um, Lily, Jenna, would either of you like to go? Because it's your duo today. You're coming together as a duo. So, Yeah, hello, everyone. Um, yeah, we, we, we really wanted to try and be together in the same space in order to um, do our kind of presentation today. But unfortunately, that wasn't possible. So, we're, yeah, we're joining together over the ether. But... I'm Lily Hayward Smith. Um, I'm a research assistant at the Centre for Dance Research in Coventry. Um, I'm a white woman with kind of a medium length brown hair and I have glasses. I'm sitting in front of a blurred background because there's sort of kids bunk beds and various things <laughs> over there. Um, and someone's bringing my water, which is excellent. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, and thank you so much for the invitation to share um, our work today. Um, I'm normally sort of on the other side of these um, things, so I'm nervous but excited to be able to share some of my work today with my long-standing friend and colleague, Jenna. Cool. Um, I'm Jenna Hubbard. Um, I'm presenting today with Lily. Um, I... Um, a senior lecturer in dance at the Arts University in Bournemouth. Um, so I'm down on the south coast. Yeah, Lily and I tried really hard to make our lives coordinate enough to be together today. So um, unfortunately, that wasn't possible. Um, I'm a white woman. I have dark hair um, that's shoulder length. I also have a fringe over my forehead. So that's a the theme of today. Um, I have a um, white wardrobes behind me. I have a really exciting plant in the window over my right shoulder and blue curtains around me. Um, I'm as, similarly, I'm thrilled to be part of today. So thank you very much for the invite, Rosa. Thank you. Thank you, Jenna. And last but certainly not least, Sarah. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. Rosa. Thank you. Thank you. It's so nice to be here and great to see so many friends and colleagues here. Um, I'm Sarah Botley, uh, also from the Centre for Dance Research at Coventry University. Um, I'm a older middle-aged woman I'm never quite sure what to say there but I'm getting on um, I've got light brown hair um, I'm wearing a grey jumper but my background's rather um, bland it's just a white background and I'm wearing glasses and a microphone and headphones Thank you. And I see that people are using the chat. Yes, please do say hello. Um, let us know where you are, what your roles are, if any questions or comments. I will be monitoring the chat as well and bringing those into the conversation. We will have a space to um, reflect and discuss a lot of the the on what is discussed today. So that will happen a little bit later. But do feel free to still um, use the chat um, as you wish. Um, so before we get into the actual offerings, um, we'll play a short video from our colleagues from KU Leuven, um, from Fred Troyan, from the, it, that is helping us frame the capacity building lab days. So WEAVE is an EU funded project. Um, we're coming to the very end of it in end of September. So we've had a series of lab days looking at different strands within the project. We've been using the term cultural communities, but that means a lot of different things within the project that in some instances means the Roma community in other instances we've been looking at the Portuguese folk dance community as well as the um, Catalan Castellar so it's a real mix of looking at tangible and intangible cultural heritage um, and today obviously we're looking at dance in the body and archives but it'd be um, I think great for you to understand the, the broader um, picture that Weave is working um, and trying to build and navigate. So without further ado, uh, Koza, could we have Fred's video, please? Hello, um, welcome to this uh, Weave Lab Day. Um, I am Fred Tryon from Leuven University. And uh, together with the partners uh, in Weave, uh, WEF stands for Widen European Access to Cultural Communities through Europeana. 
we are preparing for you uh, a series of capacity building uh, workshops uh, as a second round in lab days that we do to uh, foster understanding and innovation in the way uh, minority content is represented in heritage collections and in particular how this shows in Europeana. As you know, Europeana is the European portal to uh, contents of heritage institutions. And uh, when you aggregate this uh, content and bring them together from diff uh, different sources, it strikes how the contents have been described from particular points of view. And this poses a special problem uh, for minorities uh, in Europe. Uh, minorities such as, for, for example, the Roman, Romani people, uh, notice that they have been documented in these official collections essentially as foreigners, as people with another culture that is not the mainstream culture of the institutions that hold uh, these collections and are now in the process of bringing those online. And so the idea of our lab days is in the first place to get an understanding of what the real diversity of perspectives in cultural practices really is. And secondly, to derive the, from that insights in how we could um, teach institution professionals to uh, better the way they add descriptions to their contents and they select and curate these contents. Often these contents have been selected from an external point of view and not from an interest in the symbolic value and the cultural meaning of what the cultural practice is that is documented. And so what we want to offer is uh, insights that we can use to train professionals in the sector. This could be catalographers, archivists, curators, uh, audience developers, to make sure that they see where in the digitization and the description process, they can intervene to come to better contents and also how in uh, organizing uh, user engagement activities, uh, they can take these perspectives into account. Uh, and this involves both more technical issues, such as metadata management, as indeed um, curational policies, uh, selection criteria, ways of uh, user empowerment and engagement. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for your presence uh, today, and I hope you enjoy this uh, session. So Fred was giving us a very generic overview of some of the larger questions um, we've been asking ourselves um, within the project as a consortium, but also um, putting forward towards Europeana and other um, institutions that we're engaging with. But at the same time, we've also been working alongside artists um, and researchers and thinking about what are some of the questions um, and, and approaches that the different um, communities are using. And so um, as you registered for the day, you might have seen that, you know, we are asking ourselves and questions around technology and access. Um, how do we give visibility to works and archives outside of Europe and North America? And what are some of the questions around language that might emerge in doing that? And how do we recognize the social and the personal within the archive? Um, and so, you know, and what can dance and how can that, how can dance in the lived experience um, help us look at 
curatorial practices and archival materials, um, what's traceable, what's not. Um, and so to do that, we have four archives today um, that we'll be looking at that have reflected on these questions in a number of different ways. So um, each of you will have about 10 to 12 minutes to present. You might see me say, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, so yes, uh, so let's begin. I think Rachel, you were first. Yes, so thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't have a presentation today. I'm just gonna be talking about some of the questions, I suppose, and um, ideas that have come out of my research, um, primarily with my current research, which is with Chisholm House Dance Space. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a second year PhD student at CDARE. Um, and in my previous research, I have been drawn to look at dance collectives and groups. And this includes the X6 collective cycles. And as I mentioned um, in my current PhD research, Chisholm House Dance Space. So I'm approaching today's conversation of archives and the dancing body from the perspective of the collective dancing body. For me, what is interesting about the collective as opposed to the dance company is the potential in the group structure to provide support and context for individuals to develop their practice. And this may or may not mean making actual work together. The collective body is bound by a shared politic, philosophy and or aesthetic. Historically speaking, collectives across the arts have provided a structure in which to challenge cultural, political or social hegemony, particularly in the face of oppression. So in my work with X6, Cycles and Chisholm, I've been working with their respective historic material. Um, although I should note here that whilst I often refer to this material as an archive, none of this material has been formally archived. Um, in the case of X6 and Cycles, the material I was working with was sourced from personal archives of those involved. Chisholm House is slightly different because it's undergoing a process um, where it will eventually become an archive and I'm working with that during, during the process. Um, however, given the work that I'm referring to dates back to the mid 1970s, nearly 50 years ago, I think it's interesting that this material, um, you know, material regarding the new dance period in, in Britain, which is a hugely important part of British dance history, the fact that that's currently not available in any of the major dance archives in the UK, um, you know, raises some important questions about the structural limitations that pertain to archives, but particularly to dance archives. To varying degrees, some of the artists involved in these collectives do have their individual work archived, but no collective archives currently exist. And so I wonder if dance collectives in particular pose additional challenges within the archive. Um, in the case of X6 and Chisholm in particular, the context of the collective is really important to kind of understanding the work and also um, historically understanding where this work was coming from. So there is a question about how the collective can be archived or recognized as well as the individual work. There is an additional question here about what more can be done within his, his, existing historic material, archived or not, to promote accessibility and to continue challenging what it is that's being archived and how. So to go back to um, my own research, what I'm particularly interested in is the sociology of artistic production and how specifically the collective in response to its political, cultural or social environment enables new work and ideas to be developed. Within this, I'm interested in how the archive might be used to access this sort of knowledge, i.e. what the lived experience of, of being in that particular environment at that particular time and responding to it through things like the collective, what that was like. The Dance Collective provides a window into this lived experience. And something I've been thinking about within this is Raymond Williams's concept of structure of feeling. Um, and although it's quite a sort of ambiguous concept in some ways, I think it's quite useful when thinking about this. Um, at the core of Williams's proposal, um, he suggests to analyze cultural forms, but specifically art within the complex whole of society in order to gain an understanding of the felt sense of quality of life, rather than analyzing elements such as art forms in isolation in society. And in that case as well, you, you're kind of only analyzing those dominant forms um, that, that remain are, and are archived. So things get lost. Um, when Williams is talking about the structural feeling, he's, he's particularly interested in what he describes as the emergent forms, things that are coming out often in opposition to the, the dominant forms. 
Um, Williams acknowledges that the structural feeling operates in a very delicate and maybe the least tangible parts of our social activity. And the challenges of capturing the structural feeling, I think, are shared with those faced in archiving and the preservation of collective activity and also in dance, um, you know, which are both embodied and ephemeral. For the work of X6 and New Dance practitioners at Chisholm, the collective is a contextual layer within the wider polit political, social and cultural environment in Britain during the 1970s and 80s. In both instances, the work, organisation and structure of the two collectives was underpinned by discourses of second wave feminism. Discussing the role of dance notation in choreographic documentation, Frederick Pouliard says that choreographic creation has never or very rarely happened on paper. It always passes through the actualizing bodies of its performers. He goes on to say that the work's identity thus seems to depend more on its material history of production and transmission than on any isolation of general features that could be represented through dance notation. So although here um, what's being spoken about is dance notation, I think um, his observation of dance's inherent relationship to its mode of production and transmission provides a really good argument for the importance of contextual information in the archive. And this relates not just to my examples of the collective structure, but also as an important insight to the broader contextual information that's available, um, particularly within dance archives. Of course, one way of broadening the historical context of dance archives is by including as much information as possible across as many formats as possible um, in order to facilitate embodied and experiential knowledges. Oral histories plays an important and relatively obvious role here. In my research, which is in how dance space, I found oral histories to be a valuable resource in understanding the inner workings of the collective. Oral histories not only contribute to the contextual information, but also help to enhance the legibility of existing archival documents that otherwise I, I probably wouldn't be able to access that sort of information. So as well as promoting information in as many formats as possible, there is also a consideration for thinking about what information is included. And this kind of goes back to thinking about um, non-dominant narratives and things that might be excluded from the archives. Much of the ephemeral work of the collective, friendships, lived experiences, personal testimony, conversations are often not archived. But in order for us to understand the work in its entirety, there is a need to situate this personal within the scholarly interpretation of the archival material. Someone that I think is quite interesting um, in talking about this as in terms of informal knowledges is uh, Irik Rogoff, and she discusses gossip as testimony and its potential within feminist practices of producing counter historical narratives in which feminist epistemology does not pursue a broadening of, of existing categories to include female subjects, but rather revises those very categories, questioning the historical narratives which produce them, produce them and daring to imagine new alternative narratives. So following from Rogoff, oral history as a method that coincides with archival study brings unauthorized forms of knowledge and narrative into critical consciousness and acknowledges their legitimacy. In doing so, it challenges the categories that we've been traditionally subjected to working within. And I think for dance, this is a really useful way of, of thinking about archives and um, you know, what is documented. But it's also particularly relevant to the work of X6 and Chisholm as collectives underpinned by feminism, but also dance more broadly. Given all of this, I think that the ephemeral nature of collective activity and the supposed difficulty in archiving it actually places the work in a position to positively challenge traditional modes of archiving and archival study. And I think the same can be said about dance. There is an opportunity within the field to rethink the archive because of the different qualities that it holds, maybe in comparison to other, documenting other forms of history. This is a sentiment explored by Timmy DeLay as he considers dance as a typically anarchival object, which resists easy encapsulation in traditional documentary forms. And thus this elusiveness could be one of its greatest strengths rather than weaknesses in remodeling the archive according to current needs. However, of course, one of the problems is, is that the embodied knowledge of oral histories relies on people with, di with a direct relationship to the work and accessing this valuable information requires them obviously to be alive and well. 
I've been in a really lucky position um, with my research so far that I've been able to make contact with all those involved with the X6 and lots of those involved with Chisholm Howe's early history. But nonetheless, I'm confronted with the urgency of doing this work. So I think in light of the importance of this embodied knowledge um, and the current limitations that we, we recognize in the archive, it is a reminder that this work is urgent and, and we, we should act sooner rather than later to try and challenge and change how things um, are accessed or are, are accessible. Um, as well as thinking about the information in the descriptions of records and engaging with oral histories as a research method, another way to broaden contextual information within the archive might be to make more active connections to other archives that extend beyond the field of dance and in doing so promote interdisciplinarity. These interdisciplinary connections need not be limited to archives, they could extend to making connections between other public resources, such as public art collections and exhibitions. Broadening the contextual information available provides a way to situate dance work, not just within the collective context, as in the examples of X6 and Chisholm, but also within its broader political, social and cultural context. It helps to provide insight to the lived experience of the individual and collectives making the work, and provides an opportunity to analyze the work within this collective whole of society that, that Williams talks about. This, what I've been talking about in some way, ah, oh, thank you, Rosa. Um, I will maybe just, just skip this a little bit and, and just summarize, but I think some of these things that I've been talking about links to what's been termed participatory archiving. And this includes engaging archivists and historians with community members to share the work of archiving. And I think this can be a really productive way to move forward. Um, within this approach, the archivists become almost like facilitators, collaborating with community members to both form archives, but also to work on existing collections in order to contribute to descriptions through online tagging and commentary by users. So this allows knowledge that may not otherwise be accessible or may not have the time or resources to actually add to what we know about this information. And then finally, my last ob observation, just to sum up very quickly, extending from the proposal to work with archives in an interdisciplinary way is a proposal to consider different ways of working with archival material. And so for me, this is specifically within a curatorial context. In my work curating exhibitions, workshops, research groups and performances, I found that archival study, oral histories and curation interlink in a really productive way that allows for embodied knowledge located in the individual and the collective body to be accessed and shared. In the context of archival research, the curatorial embraces Chisholm House collection of his historical material as a site for discussion, collaboration, inquiry, and collaboration is really central to some of the things that I've been talking about. In curation or histories and archival studies, there is the potential for new connections, relationships and knowledges which create synergies with both the material and one another as, a pro as processes to be formed. And as such, the research process itself begins to adopt performative qualities. And I'll stop there so as to not overrun. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. So much uh, juiciness in there. And I think it sets the tone for the rest of the archives. Um, so we'll swiftly move into Monica, who um, will discuss the Ever uh archive. And one of the things you said, Rachel, around kind of the interdisciplinary way of working, but also the friendships and um, the way that material is located within the body and that embodied knowledge. Um, I think, uh, Monica, your presentation will really um, unpack that a bit more. Uh, so over to you, Monica. Okay, uh, I'm going to share my screen. Is that okay? Can you see? Okay, so um, this is the Eva Schu archive. In Portuguese, it's called uh, Carne Digital Archive Eva Schu. That means uh, digital flash, uh, the Eva Schu archive. Um, I'm going to put time here for me. Uh, so, Eva Xu is a pioneer in contemporary dance teaching in Brazil. She created more than 100 choreographies, 
she also disseminated dance practices based on improvisation and collective action. And she has been training artists of national and international projection. She's still alive uh, uh, and well and working and collaborating with us. So it is a digital dance archive about the life and work of Eva Shu, consisting of texts, documents, photos, and videos provided at LUMI Digital Repository of Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. The videos are still hosted at YouTube platform, but we will we'll move them as soon as possible. Uh, the Eva Shu archive was launched in at August 2021, but it is still in progress. The archive also contains the idea of a library of digital movements developed through the digit digitization of movements from Eva Shu technique using motion capture. I don't, um, uh, I'm going to be quickly to show you how you work it with the, rep the digital repository of uh, university, because I saw there are a lot of li libraries here. So just to, to show a little bit, um, uh, the, the archive is in Portuguese, but we have also um, English version. And uh, so how did you, how we work it with, um, with uh, photos? So here, okay. So here, we, uh, the, the organization of the archives uh, follows, uh, follows some uh, ideas about the Eva Schultz choreography. So here we have how to catch an instant uh, uh, that we, where we document the choreographies. And so we can go there. And when we open gallery, we see the gallery and, uh, okay, takes a time. I just want to show you how we documented the photos. So they are, um, they are, um, they are at the, this digital repository, and we made uh, uh, a, a, high, a big uh, work about uh, uh, writing and creating metadata. And so this is uh, so all the archive uh, work and project is related to uh, the Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. So I'm going to continue. So in the current phase, there are four, so the digital archive is organized in sections whose titles refer to Eva Schultz choreographies, as I was saying to you. Uh, so uh, we have in the corner of time, uh, the, we talk about uh, Eva Schultz biography, how to catch an instant, and we have also uh, Anima Dance Company, that is the company created by Eva Schultz. Then we have how to catch an instant, uh, where we documented the choreographies. And then we have metamorphosis, uh, where we talk about teaching and creation pro process. And then we have the library of digital movements. In the current phase, there are four choreographies available, representing different moments in the choreographer's, choreographer's career. Umberro Gaúcho, Caixa de Ilusões, Catch ou Como Segurar um Instante, and Aquados. Uh, both created, uh, all the choreographies created with Anima Companhia de Dance. Uh, so uh, until the end of this year, we are planning the documentation of at least 10 more choreographies. And the, we hope the digital library of movement will be developed in 2022. Uh, I'm going to try to answer some questions and uh, uh, make a reflection about that. So the development of the digital movement library is one of the great challenges of the project, as it assumes the use of sophisticated technologies that are still incipient in Brazil. So we did some, um, uh, some pilot projects. We have been working in partnership with Biodyna Biodynamics Laboratory of the School of Physical Education, Physiotherapy and Dance at, at Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul that has the motion capture systems Vicom Optical Passive. 
taking our reality as reference, the mentioned system was only used for biomechanical analysis of a specific movement routines. And the equipment is located on a room with a force platform and with reduced space to move. We also did some collaboration with Sidar and Dr. Karen Wood, collecting some data from Notch A when Dr. Karen Wood visited us at the uh, Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, well, um, why are we working with also uh, documents, photographies, videos, photos, videos, and also uh, trying to work uh, with uh, this kind of uh, uh, documentation? Because we are uh, still looking for uh, the ways of uh, documenting embodied knowledge. Uh, so for us, uh, working with mocap and all these uh, technologies is another way to try uh, to document uh, embodied uh, knowledge and all this uh, richness, all this variety uh, of uh, techniques and uh, bodywork proposed by, developed by Eva Schul. Well, all, the whole project has been developed with a small budget from CAPES Foundation. Uh, it's from Ministry of Education Brazil that permits to engage undergraduate and PhD students to work on the archive. I highlight here the work of one of these students, Pedro Rocha, uh, that created the website. The Evershow Archive is part of the, we have a lot of uh, collaboration, we don't have a lot of money, but we collaborate and exchange with many people and many uh, um, sectors of our university. One of them is the Center for Sports Memory uh, that provided this, all this access to the, the LUMI, the digital uh, repository from the university. Uh, so, uh, and of course, the, this project is also part of a research project. Uh, and we, we've been recognized also from the dance community uh, with many exchanges and we won a prize uh, given from uh, to, to dance, uh, to, to artists and to projects related to dance. So I'm going uh, to talk a little bit about, about uh, all this question that uh, uh, I've been working with about being uh, out of the center, uh, being in the global south, uh, and all this relation uh, regarding language and uh, power and uh, all, all these things. That it's something that um, I always uh, think about when uh, we are doing this work and we are taking uh, our project uh, to, to 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 establish some dialogues uh, with the world. Uh, it's our idea. It's being local, but also uh, trying to be more and more in the world. And how do how we do we deal with that? So uh, I'm trying. We are working with this idea idea of uh, crossing borders and interrogating geographies. Uh, so crossing borders is part of Eva Schul's life. She was born in a post-war refugee camp in Europe, in Italy. And the family first went to Uruguay and then moved to Porto Alegre when Eva was eight years old. So we have some. In the 70s, um, Eva lived between Brazil, Argentina, and Montevideo in New York. Her life and her work reveal her commitment with a dance practice that embodies affective, aesthetic, and ethical perspectives committed with freedom, cultural activism, and political resistance. That is one of the reasons that made me choose to be with Eva Shu since the 90s, first as dancer and then as a researcher that continues to dance. My journey, my journey both as an artist and a research has been encored in the purpose of understanding the different contexts and paradoxes within the Brazil society and its capabilities and impossibilities to contribute to dance and to transform certain realities. So I've been building strategies to understand some dance practices developed in Brazil regarding local concepts, contexts, experiences, and traditions. While developing 
the Evershow Archive. I've been trying to position this project in this complex framework, and I've been asking, are we being colonized, trying to appropriate technologies and methodologies, maybe with poor results, and trying to insert the Evershow Archive in the dominant discourses about dance, board, and technology? Or are we trying to decolonize and enable a kind of cross-cultural cross knowledge sharing, cross-cultural knowledge sharing based on ever students practices that has been developed in Southern Brazil? I don't have the answer. Maybe this answer doesn't exist and the question should be made every day. But uh, I continue to argue that the elaboration of digital archives in dance must consider the contexts of globalization and the needs of product fabrication that meet the social and cultural demands of Brazil. In this sense, the development of the Evershu archive should be an example for how, of how Brazilian dance practitioners can appropriate technologies for their own benefits, contributing to the construction of memories of the Brazilian dance and enable enabling the cross-cultural knowledge sharing, this cross-cultural knowledge sharing, based on dance produced in Southern Brazil. We assume that through documenting Eva Shu, and now we are developing a new project and we are going to have our own mocap system because uh, you are inserted in a big project leaded by Goldsmith University in UK. Uh, that uh, wants to build a network with people and dancers from uh, not from uh, North Global. Uh, so we are also document started to document in this project Yara Deodoro, choreographist that uh, uh, is a choreographer uh, coming from the Afro-Brazilian diaspora. So uh, we are trying to open our possibilities of documenting not just contemporary, but uh, contemporary and Afro-Brazilian dance. Uh, so we think that uh, uh, documenting these uh, choreographers and their work uh, will be able to share embodied experiences that defy Western dance and the dominant discourse about dance, body and technology, challenging the canon of dance practices that have typically engaged with digital work. We also intend with this project to increase the access to digital technologies, technologies by Brazilian dance artists, envisaging an opportunity to enhance activism and cultural expression in the digital world. Okay. So I hope you can discuss more. Thank you. I'm going to just close here. Thank you, Monica. Thank you so much. Um, I love this idea of kind of the local, but also thinking about the global and how officials navigated these various um, areas, countries, geographies, um, and you know also the the work that you're doing using technology and motion capture to help look at some of that work, um, a body of work, because I know that the the archive is quite <laughs> has a lot of material and you've also um been part of the cedar invite series where you really kind of talk about the the different aspects of the archive and i put that link into the chat so that people can watch that if they want to learn more about the archive and really understand how you've built it um and and what that work really looked like so that's in the chat for people um so very swiftly now moving over to our duo for the day, who are also friends and colleagues and have been um, curating a number of different um, events, uh, working with archives in a number of different spaces, both indoor and outdoor spaces. So over to Lily and Jenna. Thanks, Rosa. I'm just gonna take a quick share screen and then Lily's gonna get started. Yes. I see that we are using the chat. We have, as Monica said, that we have librarians in the space. Um, we also have um, different people from uh, the London Studio Centre. Um, thank you. We have uh, 
um, managers from archive management so uh, a nice mix so please do feel free to offer any thoughts and questions that are emerging for you um, as the presenters share their their um, archives with you so over to you Lily and Jenna Thank you, Rosa. Um, and thank you, Rachel and Monica, for your presentations. There's lots of new things kind of bubbling in and I can see Jenna's brain working as well. And we have lots more to discuss <laughs> after this. Um, so what we're sharing with you today is a project that um, Jenna and I did in 2016, which was the Summer Dancing Archive Project. Um, I'm just going to do a very brief sort of history of what Summer Dancing is. Um, and then, um, yeah, over to Jenna. But we're, Jenna is doing the presentation and we're kind of talking separately. So forgive us if there's a little bit of clunkiness in that. Um, so the Summer Dancing Festival um, began in Coventry in June, 2007. Jenna and I were studying for our BA in dance at Coventry University at the time. The festival was founded by Katie Coe, who was a dance lecturer at Coventry at the time as well. And the festival was a gathering of local, national, international and international dance and visual artists bringing workshops, performances and installations to Coventry. There was also an artist residency that was attached to this and a graduate platform. So Jenna and I started at the festival helping out as student helpers doing general tasks to support the running of the three day event. It ran yearly until June 2010. And then over the time the festival became um, an eight day event, it became a full on year long process to, to organize this. So we decided to take it to a biennial event every other year um, and the collective that were working on the festival, so myself, Jenna, Katie Co, and Amy Voris, another colleague, um, we um, developed the organisation Decoder to continue running the festival and other sort of similar events across the year. So our roles in the festival, Jenna and I's roles in the festival and in Decoder developed over this time from being student helpers to include production, curation, making and performing our own work, as well as performing in other artists' work at the time, um, and as well as then also being directors of the Dakota organisation. It was decided in 2016 that that would be the final Summer Dancing Festival, and we were invited, Jenna and I, to contribute something. Um, we had been present for all of the work to date, so we were in a very unique position to reflect upon the festival. Part of our role as the fest at the festival included making, collecting, storing physical resources from each year, and we had these resources to share. And our aim with this project was, in simple terms, to honour the festival, um, remember it, and all of the artists that were involved. Over to you, Jenna. Thanks, Lil. Um, so a little bit about our process. So we started collaborating together as students in a variety of different projects. Um, and then as artists, we developed a process of working together, which included using improvised scores focused around memory, objects, voice, and our shared experiences as friends, colleagues, and collaborators. This long collaboration has actually been documented in a film for the Dancing Bodies in Coventry Project, which was led by Rosa um, and Marie-Louise Crawley. We have worked um, with the same process on several different projects where we move, talk and remember in each rehearsal session and only what is remembered from the previous session will be built, up, built upon. Um, in this way, we're really not precious about presenting all of the facts or all of a memory, but allow ourselves to present the prominent memories through that process. It felt very natural to use this memory process in the archive project rather, and rather than worrying about presenting every single fact, every single truth about the festivals, we allowed the personal and the anecdotal, anecdotal to come to the fore. We had an unusual perspective on the festival, as Lily mentioned, as we'd experienced it from an internal position, from organ organisational roles and behind the scenes, as well as participating in the workshops and performing in work as part of the festival. So we felt really uniquely placed to do this work. I can't see the next slide, Jenna. Ah, can everybody see that? I can see our process slide. I can't see the starting places slide. Seconds, let me just re-share. Okay. Sorry, everybody. So I'll just continue talking and get the next screen up. 
So before um, the festival, we had a, a kind of week long residency um, where we met to discuss and reflect upon the festival and collect our memories. We shared with each other what works or performances were most prominent in our minds. And we approached the artists of these um, for permission to explore and recreate or reinterpret their work um, that was commissioned, um, that they were commissioned to bring to the festival. Um, so their work and also their creative processes that they were engaged in at the time and also shared, shared with us. Um, you should be able to see a video moving now of us in the space that we used. Um, so we spent the week leading up to the festival in this large blank studio space, which was in the main building of the festival, um, the Ellen Terry building in Coventry. Many previous summer dancing and Dakota workshops had, had previously taken place in this space. We began by working with physical items in the summer dancing, which is archived, which is literally a box. Um, I might show you a picture of it at some point, um, which allowed us to create a timeline. And we created a timeline of events and artifacts using the materials that we'd sort of saved. And some of which you can see. Um, the materials, physical materials we have are mostly printed, well compact, signage, maps, schedules, um, marketing materials for the festival. Um, and we also uncovered old camera tapes with footage of performances and workshops. These were not published elsewhere, anywhere else. And so we were very excited about um, being able to allow people the opportunity to watch the footage from these previous festivals. We also were interested, um, as we've touched upon already, about exploring our own lived memory um, of the archive built from our previous experiences of working together at the festival. Some of these memories were very prominent in our minds when we began, but, when, but some memories were revived through the process, triggered by the objects we found, the footage, conversations we had, and the improvisation process that we worked with together, looking at the mem working with memory and voice. And the, our process of working, as you can see here, was also documented as we went along. After excavating these materials and the memories, we created an installation in this room made up of actual archive materials and also found materials and objects, um, some from around the building and some we had ourselves. Um, these objects kind of for us represented um, the history of events that took place at the festival. So some of them weren't necessarily exactly part of what happened, but they were our own objects that kind of reminded us of, of these things that had taken place. Um, yeah, Jenna. Thank you. Um, so one of the works that we decided to reinterpret was Hilary Neal's coat piece. Um, so in 2012, Hilary Neal, who's a visual artist and a movement artist, she presented a piece of work called Coat. Um, and part of her process of working, uh, you can see the image of her on the left hand side of your screen. Um, Hilary would wear this long coat and she was staying um, in Kenilworth, which is just outside of Coventry. And she walked from Kenilworth all the way um, into Coventry and whatever the coat picked up on on the journey was part of the performance. This was a particular piece that I felt really inspired by. Um, and uh, for me, so on the right hand side is the film of me running to, uh, from Kenilworth, so from the house that she was staying in to Coventry. Um, this felt exciting, relevant for us um, because it was about blending our practices with the artist's practices. So um, we spent some time Lynn and I de debating whether we were reconstructing works, remembering them or reinterpreting them. And we felt that um, the blend of original work was met by our own process and therefore reinterpretation felt like a, a kind of better term. At the time I was running a lot and it felt relevant to run the journey that Hilary took from Kenilworth to Coventry. Um, an artist called Gianpaolo who had walked with Hilary on this original journey um, was still present in Kenilworth. So actually he ran with me um, to share the route, but also his memories of the festival. So we ran and we discussed um, what he remembered of that. Um, th uh, there was actually a bit of a debate about where Hillary ended her route. And so we reinterpreted it to end at the Lady Herbert's Garden, which um, had been a location that Lily and I had made a performance in as students. Um, and I had a really distinct memory of part of that performance of running around the space. And so it felt like if John Paul and I couldn't remember the end of the journey, it felt like a relevant thing to add into the process. 
Um, as I said, our role was to reinterpret, reinterpret rather than recreate, and we allowed the memories of the artist's process to merge with our own. Um, we knew that um, the sorting of the physical archive, that we had a lot of paperwork from the festival, and so we wanted to work all of this paperwork into the performance and the um, archive space. We remembered that Jessica Lerner's Conception Vessel piece in 2009, which had been presented at the Herbert Art Gallery, included a building of a performance space with wood, chicken wire and paper. And so we got to work creating our own version. So the images on the right hand side of your screen are from Jessica Lerner's piece. On the left is the video of Lily and I building an entrance way into our archive with all the paperwork. Because we wanted to bring to the fore the multi-layered experiences of the different roles that we had played in the festival and exposing the processes that went on behind the scenes, which are often unknown or unseen. Therefore, the organizational emails are as much part of the festival archive as the footage of the performances. And we wanted to make sure that our archive balanced all of those roles. Um, this was very much an archive project that was bringing the festival back to life through our experiences and memories of the festival in a way that would not be possible by anybody else. But in, do, in doing so, we allowed others to access the festival's past and discover it and re-remember it for themselves. Over to you, Lily. Thanks. Okay, so um, the aims of the archive project for us was um, firstly to honour and remember the festival and to mark um, the final moment of it happening, um, which obviously would hold a lot of um, kind of emotion for us and all of the other people involved. So we felt it really important to kind of honour that. We wanted to bring past festivals into the present for those that had also shared the history um, along with us, but for those also that were brand new to the festival and would have not had had access to this archive material of the festival otherwise. We wanted to create an immersive experience that allowed them to not only see what had happened, but to get a sense of what it would have been like to be there at the time and to allow them into our memory and lived experience, which could not be explained or shown through just watching old footage or looking at photographs, but we were allowing them to step back in time. And the work that you're able to see here, um, oh, it's very quickly gone. Um, so that's that was us kind of reusing a process that, um, or reinterpreting a process that we experienced with an artist called Rose McCausland, who did one of the Making Space um, artist residencies for the festival. And she worked with um, using point of view cameras. So the dancers would hold video cameras and move together um, and, and create footage from that. So here we, we're doing a similar thing using GoPros, but then the other layer of the process we're using is our improvisation um, developed ourselves. Um, so we were very aware that, thank you. <laughs> yep. Um, we were very aware that what we were presenting in the end was very personal to us um, and that the Summer Dancing Archive didn't really physically exist anywhere yet when we started. Um, there was literally a box of saved resources and documentation gathered after each festival, um, which I very recently spent quite a while looking for in the Ellen Terry building um, and I was very pleased to find. Um, and the building itself, um, Ellen Terry, has also, was also part of this kind of informal unorganised archive. It was home to many spaces, props and furniture, etc., that were, were used for the festival over the years. And we didn't go into this project thinking that we would present the absolute truth of summer dancing. It was a very subjective project, um, possibly unlike how other archives may be put together and presented, although hearing um, kind of Rachel talk about um, the Chisholm Hell archive, um, it, yeah, there's a lot of kind of reflection there for us, I think, about how um, the, the kind of context and the personal um, is as much important as the kind of actual physical documentation. Um, so I've just, I've gone off my script, so I'm just finding, so the project, um, yeah, so the project that we did and the final installation and performance that we created and, and people came uh, and visited as part of that week and now part of what continues to be this unorganized archive of summer dancing captured in film gopro gopro footage photographs new pieces of paper and our new lived experiences and memories um, and 
just want to say that the, the work that you're seeing now was us exploring um, uh, paper portraits, which was a work first created with, by Florence Peake, an artist that we worked with a lot throughout many of the different festivals. Um, so we were exploring that process of creating our own portraits using the paper that you saw there and charcoal um, and then continuing to improvise from there. Okay, I'm gonna uh, whiz through this a little bit. So um, throughout the residency, we actually physically built the exhibition in which to present the archive, um, which doubled up as a performance space. One of the things we created was this cabinet of miniature artifacts um, with each item representing a performance, a workshop, a residency, or a memory of something organizational in the festival. So lots of different snapshots. Some of these objects are real objects that were part of the project. And some of them are representations of things um, just to sort of mark as many of the pieces as we could. We also presented a range of other real and replica items in the archive. Um, so for example, uh, Florence Peake, as Lily mentioned, is an artist we worked with a lot. She had a performance called Valediction, where she drew um, images of moths as part of it. Um, one of the images was saved and it became part of the archive. So we framed that, but we allowed our audience to make their own versions of that same image. Um, so through this project, we understand that the archive is not one thing. It may have a tangible existence in a particular form, such as online or in boxes, but the memories or the lack of them means that each person will discover the archive in their own way. The Summer Dancing Archive Project installation transcended language through its use of multimedia and interdisciplinary way of presenting our findings. But it was also really alive in that people came in, they tried on costumes, they sat and they curated their own viewing of um, footage. They looked at the programs, they, they um, participated in the, the performance of the archive. So people were able to step into the world of summer dancing and get a glimpse of the moment of the past, albeit channeled through our memories and creative process. So our archive um, residency ended in a public performance and sharing where we invited people to come and look at the artifacts to be part of the performance. We actually started with a, a fake volunteer briefing as that had been a massive part of our festival experience as vo both volunteers to begin and also later um, as, organiza as organizational leads. We gave out copies of some of the physical resources such as signs and welcome packs for people to take away with them so that people could take something of the archive away which I guess is quite unusual for an archive project. Um, Lily and I then performed an improvisation score where the audience contributed their memories of the festival and we moved and talked with one another. We found through this project that it was possible to create an immersive archive, like stepping into a museum where the audience can place themselves in the archive and contribute to it. Our archive included conversations with each other and the audience, and we wondered how many archives allow conversations to be recorded and added to them um, so that the archive continues to build itself. We set about in this project to answer some of the questions about the place of memory in an archive. We wanted to establish whether archives could hold memories, past experiences and new ones all simultaneously. It felt important for both of us to play with the slippage between memory as a recollection of the past and an immersive nature of our archive as a space to create something new. Our process had always been about creating new things from the memories and therefore does the Summer Dancing Archive also become part of the archive? So does our project now become part of the archive itself? The whole project was in a way um, a way of us saying goodbye to the Summer Dancing Festival and we also allowed people to come and look and experience um, the work for themselves, albeit through our subjective lens. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you. Um, I think it's a lovely place to stop this idea of next steps. Um, uh, maybe we can come back and ask you, both of you, what you think the next steps could be, um, should be, might be. Um, but I love this idea of immersive um, uh, archives and that it's a constant kind of evolving, iterative process. Um, and I think Sarah um, will round out the day with looking at <laughs> um, archives and kind of take us full circle um, into different ways of, of how archives can kind of come and go and um, <laughs> maybe come back. Um, so Sarah, over to you, please. Thank you, Rosa. And goodness, what an extraordinary um, collection of experiences and stories you've all been telling. Um, I'm not sure at all how well I'm going to round this off, but I'll do my best. Um, I, I'm actually going to talk slightly cheekily about um, 
two archives, or at least one that never was and one that was but isn't anymore, if that makes sense. Um, because I think both of them in very different ways raise questions about what we value and what value means in the context of archives and how we place value on historical materials what is absent, what is made visible or becomes invisible. And I think, you know, through hearing the rest of you speak, um, some beautiful ways in which this slippery idea of, of embodied knowledge is, is, is brought to the fore in very many different ways, but at the same time makes me really concerned about dance being this endangered practice, frankly. Um, so just briefly about the one that never was, but could be, and I'm still hoping at some point might be, um, because there are plenty of material remains or leftovers um, waiting to be archived, um, but no formal archival records. And although I was absolutely fascinated, uh, Jenna and Lily, because I saw in one of your uh, one of your glimpses, um, uh, some of the material leftovers um, from a series of festivals that I ran in the 1980s and 90s, so don't do the maths, but that ages me, um, that we called the New Dance Festivals, um, which, which ran in Coventry for a decade and picked up the momentum very much from the Dartington dance festivals from the 70s and 80s. And, and it was a, a festival that brought together independent dancers to Coventry um, every year for workshops and performances and so on. And many of the, the leading independent dancers at the time came to participate and share their work um, and lead workshops. Sadly, some of them are no longer with us because it was a long time ago. Um, but many of those names also uh, are feature heavily at Chisenhale. So Rachel, you will have come across those names names as well. And I'm talking about people like Jill Clark, um, sadly no longer with us, but others who still are, Scott Clark, um, Rosemary Lee, Sue McLennan, and, and so on and so on. So many of those uh, really important um, independent artists. Um, and, and there we were in Coventry, and I think it's so interesting hearing about the, the, the later uh, festivals, um, the summer dance festivals, and how that, that momentum carried on through in, in later decades, and hopefully further on into the future as well. Well, you know, in Coventry, this city in the Midlands. Um, but nonetheless, the, these new dance festivals, you know, they were at a time where there, wouldn't, there was no internet. Um, so we relied very much on press releases, flyers, posters, all sorts of, you know, paper based materials um, and, and a whole collection of, of rather scratchy VHS um, uh, film records of, of the performances and workshops and so on, um, which, which thanks to, to Rosa and the Dancing Bodies in Coventry um, uh, project and, and Weave as well, um, some of those have been digitized. So we're hoping we might be able to do something with those. And, and there are some interesting kind of snatches of memories of that time um, and, and again you know because it, it's not a time when there was any internet so we didn't have that that way of using social media or anything like that to get the message out but there was a there was a wonderful uh, mention of one of the festivals by by the great Peter Brinson who, who I hope many of you will will remember who was such a huge advocate for the importance of dance within an educational context and he came to one of the festivals. They were always held about this time at Easter. And he wrote about uh, the festival at that year because our theater burnt down. It was burnt down in an arson attack. So all the performances had to go on in the fields outside the studios. And there was a famous one by Julian Hamilton um, that was recited in the fields. And Peter Brinson uh, wrote about that performance. So it, it, it's one of the very few sort of traces of, of it ever happening. And I do remember collecting up much as Jenna and Lily were talking about the sort of, you know, the paper based material uh, remains of those festivals and saying to um, to somebody at the time, I would really love to create an archive of this work and being told, oh, nobody would be interested in that. Um, it's it's really not going to be of interest. Um, and, and I'd like to prove that person wrong. Um, so and and maybe, you know, that as, as Rachel was saying, you know, the, these these documents are our memories, our traces of important cultural events and, and shine a light on our cultural landscape at the time, but they're also important social documents. And they say so much about the social time as well as the cultural landscape. So I think that, you know, these things do serve a very great purpose. Um, and the other example I just want to talk about, and I'm sure very it's 
very familiar to, to many of you, but again, it, it gives a different picture on the archive or the nature of an archive, which is um, the Siobhan Davis Replay Archive. Um, which I started work on in 2006, um, very generously funded by the Arts Humanities Research Council at the time to create a digital archive of a choreographer, Siobhan Davis. So interesting what Rachel was talking about in terms of the collective, because this was an archive of a single choreographer, um, but nonetheless, somebody who's, who is still very committed to the, the collective as an artist. So even though the work features her work, uh, the, the archive was very much focused on her work, um, it, it was attempting to do much, much more than that. And, and it's interesting to think now back to why it was funded. And I think because um, our research council recognized that we had very few um, archives as research resources at the time, particularly in cultural forms such as dance. And also I think because Davis is recognized as an important British, British choreographer, of course, um, but also her work spans the entire history of British contemporary dance. Um, so presumably was, was, was regarded as having longer term and more um, a, a stronger historical value. And what's interesting, I was just thinking about this the other day, that 2022 marks the 50 years since her first choreography. Um, Sphinx, which was made in 1972, it was the first work that was archived in what we called Siobhan Davis Replay. Um, so even though it's 50 years, it's still a relatively recent um, history. Um, and but but very sadly, um, the 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 archive itself has, has, has not had an easy um, development, even though it's only really quite young. Um, it, it did give us some wonderful opportunities to experiment because of the digital environment. Um, and in 2006, we were still playing around with, with the possibilities of what the digital environment could do for us. Um, so we were experimenting with some rather basic interactive graphic visualizations of the choreography. Um, we were creating a digital scrapbook tool um, so that we were doing much more than simply creating a repository of all her work. Um, and as I was saying, that the, the important thing for, for Davis throughout was that this is about a collective process. So we made sure that the individual artists and everybody who featured in her work were very clearly present in the archive. Um, indeed, so much present that actually many of them were involved directly in selecting the content. Um, so we made sure that um, we obviously working as ethically as we needed to. Um, we included things like personal items, like dancers' notebooks, um, their individual reflections, and a whole selection of um, rehearsal tapes, so what we call scratch tapes, um, where individual dancers were, were working through um, choreographic material and, and sort of showing what the creative thinking process is behind making work um, and, and hoping through those various processes to bring to the fore something of what of course is not usually visible when one's looking at dance works in, in a performance. So it's something about the actual archiving process um, and uh, the creative process of making work. Um, we learned a huge amount of course through making this archive. Um, uh, what 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 um, licenses, what sort of licenses we need to put in place um, to ensure that we could release the content to the public, um, what appropriate metadata schemas might be for dance content and, and much, much more. Um, but we also learned that, of course, creating and maintaining an archive uh, costs a lot of money. And we were funded for 30 months, but no longer. Um, so whilst, of course, physical archives require a, 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 an important infrastructure and the expertise to conserve and curate the content and so on, um, digital archives are nonetheless dependent on software, um, server costs, and all those other kinds of costs that, that mount up year after year. Um, and after five years, um, the software that we built on was unsupportable, so we had to migrate the, the archive to a new platform. But last year, and only 12 years after its launch, um, we ran out of money. There was no more funding to sustain the archive, so it is now no more. Um, and I'm deeply sad about that, um, as you might imagine, and, and so is Siobhan Davis. Um, the content is safe, I should say, because we were able to sort of keep the content safe, but it isn't accessible anymore. 
Um, and, it, and it's so interesting to hear about Monica's wonderful project with Ava Schull and sort of thinking this is at the beginning or the beginning, you know, near the beginning of something which is likely to have a much longer life, I hope. Um, but sadly, um, for the Siobhan Davis replay archive, um, it had a very short life. Um, and it does show that there is an inherent vulnerability in these archives. And I think, you know, the sort of work that um, uh, Lily and Jenna were talking about, you know, in terms of how you then create the, the uh, situations where archive material can continue to generate and it can be participatory and it can be uh, can be re reconstructed or remade or recreated all those lovely rewords um, but it does show just how endangered our dance content is um, and it does make me reflect a little bit on on whether or not having had a digital archive for all this time um, and and it going you know have we actually made um, made this material even more absent somehow that it had a life in a, in its particular form and now it's gone um, the only I think the only thing that I can take some solace from is that um, Siobhan Davis, um, of course, is still very much alive, very much making work. Um, and contrary to perhaps, you know, traditional notions of archives, that these are about, you know, past events, past practices, past cultural forms. Um, I think all of us are talking about um, work that is still at least in the recent history, Rachel's perhaps a little bit different, but nonetheless, and, and Rachel, you know, we might have time to hear about that, did do a, a reconstruction of some of that cycles work. So it's still very much in the present. And Siobhan Davis is doing the same. She's using that archival content as source material to make new work, um, not in any kind of reconstruction way but as source material she uses the wonderful word compost um, and and I love that idea that the archive becomes compost um, so her various kind of archival projects have definitely kind of played homage in a way to her past her choreographic history but also um, the, the the notion of archive as a cultural form and a cultural practice in order to to create new works and so in a sense the archive lives on and on in in her new work um, but it's still a great sadness for me so um, I, I do have to say, you know, rest in peace, Siobhan Davis replay, um, but the content I hope will continue to thrive, survive, and who knows, maybe I'm going to be able to make a new archive of those new dance festivals from the 1980s and 90s. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um... Well, I think there's a lot to say. And also, I love this um, idea of the compost and that, you know, it just kind of keeps feeding itself um, and it gives life to something new and it's something we might not even know that is possible. And so um, I think, you know, that came through in a number of different ways from each of the, the presentations and archives that you know, there are different ways that the tangible and intangible intersect. You know, Rachel, you were talking about um, the notation, but it still somehow goes through the body and that vessel, you know, and how that then sits in the archive and, you know, these ideas of source material and, um, you know, Jenna and Lily, it was really beautiful to see you guys kind of making and moving with the charcoal and then somehow you know it was beautiful and then you kind of rolled it up and for me it was like <gasps> you know but that's part of the process as well and and you know Monica with with the the archive it feels like you're on this new modern way of thinking about archives looking at 3d and dance in the body and how you know kind of this global framework for work that did you know cross so many boundaries in so many different ways that still she's still making work so again there, there feels like there's a lot there um that supports each other even though they're still so removed from each other in a way but there's still so much that they they can i think it shows that dance really does have a powerful space when we look at archives and language and um legacies but also and and what what we value and how we can move forward and, and what's challenged and um so i open this up to everyone for questions comments you can ask each other questions um 
I don't want to take, I can talk, so <laughs> I'll be quiet. Um, yes, any questions, feel free to use your hands, use the chats, use your real hand. Yes, Rachel. It's not really a question, but um, I was just thinking then when you were talking, Sarah, about um, how archives become visible through digital platforms and catalogues and are they more visible you know we kind of assume that they are more accessible or visible but then you know you talking about this experience um which is you know devastating after all of that work there is this question about that relationship um and also this this um maybe shift in understanding traditionally from the archive as a store as a storage of documents to now maybe thinking about it in terms of um from storage to access um because obviously you have the material from Siobhan Davies replay and, and and that's stored but it's not accessible and so I think the changing role of the archive is coming into um the conversation a bit there um but it's not a question it's just an observation really about thinking about how yeah how can dance archives be accessible um, and all the challenges within that can i respond to that because i think it's a great question um and i mean just going back to the replay example i mean what we we, we sort of questioned ourselves about that because we didn't want to simply collect and store it because it felt like even though that was valuable and important it wasn't doing what we wanted it to do, which was to actually make it accessible. And then of course you go to the digital because you make it more accessible. But in a way we sort of shot ourselves in the foot because, you know, yes, it was for a few, for a few precious years, but now it's got, it's not really cataloged. It's not really, you know, it's sort of, it's in boxes. Jenna will know this because Jenna helped me pack it up a bit uh, a few years ago um, and, and of course that it's so important that we have archives that do the work of the conservation and the storage but it's always getting that balance isn't it and how you know and we've all probably had that experience which I love but we can't do it at the moment of course but at the Victoria and Albert Museum and going into the collection rooms and the, the sort of the ritual of arriving and the and the pencil and the gloves and the you know and it's such a, a sort of revered and sacred environment which I totally respect but one couldn't get up and perform it in there you know Jenna and Lily couldn't do that you know they're scrumbling up and they're you know they, they couldn't sort of embody they couldn't make a mess of that content and turn it into something else so I think you're right to sort of you know in a way there are the sort of there's a sort of polarism going on there isn't there between the sort of the need to protect and preserve and conserve and safeguard and for it to be alive and for it to have a life or onwards um so yes great great uh, observation one that i don't have any solutions to but i think it's it's a really important one we have a question from sally it says thank you for all of the Thank you all for sharing these wonderful projects. Thinking about value, would you say new methods of evaluation were developed for projects in contract to more traditional archival projects, such as an oral history? Sally, I don't know if you want to add anything on. Contrast, oh, projects in contrast to more traditional archival projects, such as an oral history project. Uh, Mariana, did you want to respond to Sally? Yes. Okay. Yes. <laughs> from me too. Yes. Uh, it, it's really very valuable. Valuable. I, I, all the presentations were incredible. Um, I, I feel very, uh, very happy for all this serving because I'm actually, uh, I'm a contemporary dancer and uh, teacher. And uh, I'm from Greece, and I'm uh, also my. I am a first year PhD student, and uh, my research is basically basically um, on uh, document and archive contemporary dance transmission and teaching as an oral tradition. <laughs> so uh, I'm actually trying to find ways to. Um, to archive something that is 
oral, something that is ephemeral, uh, something that does not have um, uh, a bibliography of how to teach contemporary dance in 2022. So uh, I, I, don't, I don't think I have a, a concrete answer, but I feel that while developing um, and trying to um, actually uh, searching for human elements that will make uh, a, a, a living archive. Actually, I cannot, I, I feel that archiving and documents are a little bit elusive and a little bit strong words about something that is in an ongoing situation in, I, I feel that there are living organisms that they're changing and um, having this evolution over and over every day, every single time. So um, yeah, I don't think I've, I answered it, just something that connecting with everything, also the teaching archive from, uh, um, from Monica, is that right? And yeah, the history also that um, I'm also trying to find a history line, a genealogy in uh, movement and what we are teaching through years. But again, I think I can only take it as a reference because it's something that is ongoing. But thank you all, that was amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you Mariana. Monica and then Colleen. Okay. Uh, so um, when I, uh, before developing Evershoe Archive, I took a look, I started to study some uh, digital archives that we have in Brazil and all of them, uh, they have kind of podcasts and so it's a kind of marriage with uh, uh, procedures and methodologies from uh, oral history, for example. And, uh, and we also, with the uh, Evershoe archives, it's not just, uh, we are not just collecting, let's say, and documenting, but we are also producing materials, still producing with her, because um, I studied also Siobhan Dave's uh, replay, but ever she, she doesn't have uh, all her career so well documented, not too many videos. So uh, we are always all producing material together to be in the archive, I think. I, I always see all this as a, uh, we are always, um, doing the digital and going to the live. When we launched the project, we did uh, an, an open class, a workshop. There was uh, 100 dancers just to do uh, classes with Evershow before pandemics. So we are, uh, the project started with, uh, it's the opposite from Lily and Gina. Uh, we started in 2010 doing recreation of Eva Schultz choreographies. So I, for me, it always is going and coming back to the to the to the live body, to the dancing body. And I think it's the way uh, to to keep alive in the as Sarah says, a generating generative uh, archive of oh, sex. Thank you, Monica. Thank you. Colleen, I'm aware of the time, so if people do need to zip off, please. Um, but I, I, Colleen, you've had your hand up, so please, Colleen. Just to say thank you very much. I'm sorry I was at physiotherapy, so I was late. But um, uh, all of the kind of um, uh, creative solutions that people have come up with are fascinating to me, and um, I've just been really involved recently with um, Contact Quarterly and the office closing and um, Nancy Stark Smith dying and she had an incredible personal archive which is boxed up and will be sent to the Lincoln Center um, Public Library but that that is funded by Jerome Robbins I think the rights to West Side Story one of his musicals so like that's something that even though it's at a public library, which makes it accessible, the funding for that particular project comes from, <laughs> you know, um, a dance artist who, you know, signed off the rights for, you know, one of his commercial successes. And I think um, I just really re like feel for Sarah with the, 
with the archive for that that archive was amazing and, and and I don't know I'm just like thinking I know we have to stop but um I don't know what the answer is and then knowing that there are these I, I also like there's something about dance because it's a relational practice and the notebooks that choreographers make and all the things that generate not the final product is fascinating so you know not just the digital recording of the thing but like you know I, I, there's something about being able to touch the objects too that's important it's just that it's so expensive to maintain them and then ha the accessibility thing is a huge question because every single dance artist I know does have boxes and boxes of, of notebooks and photographs and they're incredible like to see that that thinking that happens um and I don't know if, if there's a way that that that's valued you know I it's just expensive you know and and the resources to do that um whether it's digitized or a combination um I don't know, but I, I, I think they're really valuable things, like Sarah said, that as cultural um, mapping uh, a time in our history. And um, I'm just really excited to keep talking about it and, and finding creative solutions. And also that idea that you can create new things from the materials that exist um, because they're, they can still generate, um, the ideas are still generative. So I'm just really appreciative of all, all your work and, uh, happy to keep talking about this <laughs> and I just also to mention to the person who said who just to spoke Mariana I don't know if you, you know about IDOC Day I I'll just email it to you it's, it's a project also that had funding temporarily which then they keep creatively finding new ways to reframe it so they keep getting the funding but that's a that's an archive of contemporary dance teachers of their own um, so you might have a look at that for your research Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we all love dance and want it to continue to grow and transform society in a number of different ways. We all know the potential that dance has. So we just have to keep kind of knocking on doors and asking people um, and also just, you know, staking a claim that dance has a real potential. And um, and I think, you know, these spaces and projects like Weave and others um, that have been mentioned today are all kind of chiseling away at that because it is important, I think, and it is about values and challenging those capitalist structures that we all are functioning in in some way or another. Um, so thank you to everyone. I'm very grateful. Please do follow us on our Weave newsletter. There's a Padlet that you'd be welcome to um, share your thoughts. We'll circulate that link. Um, but in the meantime, I will say thank you for joining us. Have a lovely day. And as always, we have an outro with music for each lab day. So Kozer, if we could have that music, please.